Have you ever seen the other side of the moon? Ah, I caught you. Of course not. But maybe you've seen it in photos. In that case, have you ever wondered why the two sides look so different? Well, let me tell you. We can't see the other side of the moon. People believe this is because the moon doesn't rotate around its axis. But this is not true. The moon does rotate. It just does it at the same rate as its orbital motion. This is a particular case of tidal locking called synchronous rotation. The first time we ever saw a far side was only in 1959, all thanks to the Soviet Luna missions and later the US Apollo program. Now, when Luna 3 and other spacecraft transmitted the first far side images, they revealed a far more cratered hemisphere that looked more like Mercury or Jupiter's moon Callisto. It looked completely different from what we were used to. And that's when we learn how meh the other side is. No, seriously, just look at it. The near side can boast its thinner and smoother crust. These beautiful dark splotches are called lunar mare, the last remnants of ancient lava flows. And when I say ancient, I mean it. They're more than 3 billion years old. Meanwhile, the far side crust is thicker and crater pocked. The lava flows had almost no effect on these impact craters. It's also devoid of any large-scale mare. Low-key looks like dried white cheese. To be honest, don't you agree that the nearby side is much more beautiful? Write your thoughts in the comments. So, only 50 years ago, we learned something about the apparent differences. But then the scientists discovered something weird. Both sides are different, even in the geochemical composition. And not only in this, our side was thinner than the far side by several miles. But where did such significant differences come from on an ordinary floating stone ball? For scientists, this was a mystery. They started coming up with a lot of theories. The melted moon theory was the main one for a while. It said that it was the Earth's fault that our moon looks like this. This happened several billion years ago. The moon was born because of a collision. One day, an object about the size of Mars crashed into the Earth. At that moment, a piece broke off from it, which later became the moon. However, this piece was somewhere 15 times closer to Earth than it is now. Some scientists created pictures of the so-called early moon. Unlike our cute little white ball, the early moon was a strange-looking boiling scarlet ball. That piece didn't leave us after the separation. It became tidally locked very soon after. The Earth after the collision was still an incandescent nightmare, full of fire and lava. It was boiling at a temperature of 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And since the moon has always been turned toward us with one side, this side has melted down a little. This would explain why the moon's surface, the so-called mantle, is thinner on the near side than on the far side. During the boiling of the Earth, certain elements evaporated from it. They then settled on the Moon. This would explain the difference in geochemical composition between the two sides. But there was a plot hole in this theory. If that's what happened, then where did rare foreign chemical elements come from, such as unusual isotopes of phosphorus, potassium, or tungsten? The nearby site is full of them, and they couldn't have come from the Earth. There were also other theories. Another one said that, initially, we had two teeny-tiny moons. Later, they merged into a big one, hence the difference in their composition. But this theory sounds a bit crazy, and it has a plot hole, too. For example, the transition between the two sides is way too soft. If our moon was actually two tiny moons, this transition would be more abrupt. So scientists were kind of at a loss on this one. But recently, they finally figured out what really happened to the moon, all thanks to NASA's GRAIL orbiters. They spent over a year whizzing around the moon, mapping it out, and studying its composition. Using this data, scientists have created around 360 computer simulations. They contain different impacting objects of many sizes traveling at different speeds. Scientists were comparing the results with our current moon they try to determine which result was the closest to what we have today. And so, they finally solved this 50-year-old mystery. The answer lies in a collision with a dwarf planet. This collision occurred 4.3 billion years ago. This huge object was slightly larger than Ceres. 
For those who don't know, Ceres is one of the dwarf planets of our solar system. Its diameter is 580 miles. You could say that one France or one Germany would fit into it. So, this giant object crashed into the moon, somewhere near the South Pole. This collision was so strong that it changed the image of the moon forever. It left a trail of 3,500 miles behind. It would take you 14 hours by plane to fly that distance. This crater covered the entire near side of the moon. It caused damage to the moon's mantle. It also created a so-called South Pole Aiken Base, or SPA Basin. This is an impact crater and has a diameter of 1,600 miles, which is like adding one UK plus one Germany. It's important, though. The formation of this basin was a defining event in the history of the moon, and it's the second largest impact crater in the solar system. The collision also caused a powerful hot wave to spread across the moon. This wave scattered over the remnants of those rare, warm minerals scientists found on the nearby side. That's how our beautiful side became home to something called Procellarum creep terrain, or PKT for short. This is basically a compositional anomaly, a concentration of potassium, phosphorus, and other rare elements like thorium. You can say that those minerals are a gift to us from deep space. Anyway, there were many, and I mean many, collisions in the moon's history. All of them only deepened this already large crater. That's why the mantle on the near side was getting thinner and thinner with the years. Also, our gifted minerals gave off a lot of heat, so the mantle has melted a little bit more and more. Oops, this accidentally caused the moon's volcanoes to wake up. Volcanic activity has increased on the near side. Intense lava flows filled the old empty craters. Ta-da! And this is how the beautiful lunar mare was born. Uh, that's about how it all happened. All this information was found thanks to the researchers from Brown, Purdue, Stanford Universities, and NASA's JPL. The research was published by the Journal of Geophysical Research, Planets. So you can read about it in more detail if you're interested. There are still many things we need to learn about the moon. The highest priority is the return mission from the South Pole, the Aitken Basin. Samples brought from there will be used to determine the age of the moon, its history, and the nature of the crust and mantle more accurately. Another critical target is the Moskovians. This is the name of a large lava plain on the far side of the moon. Studying it will help us better understand the difference between the two sides, as well as tell us how the other side was formed. All this knowledge is significant for understanding the history of the moon, but it's also handy for space exploration in general. Scientists use the moon as a reference point to determine the age of other planets and entire worlds in space. The moon helps us determine the chronology of the life of the whole solar system. So stay tuned for new exciting research and discoveries. China's U-22 is a robotic mission to the dark side of the moon, launched on December 7, 2018. On January 3, 2019, it completes the first ever soft landing on the lunar far side. It lands in the von Karman crater, not far from the moon's south pole. Scientists are interested in this area. Cold, permanently shadowed craters at the poles contain water ice. These ice patches are uneven and are likely to be ancient. In the south, most of the water ice is concentrated in craters. And at the North Pole, it's spread more sparsely. In any case, this ice can be used once a long-term manned mission lands on the moon. Anyway, several days after U-22 lands, it closes down its operating systems and hibernates through its first lunar night. It wakes up on January 29, 2019. All its tools operate normally. The rover travels 390 feet during its first full lunar day. One lunar day lasts for about 14 days, and a lunar night has the same duration. Moving and exploring during the day and switching off during the night becomes the rover's routine. It's the eighth lunar day when U-22 stumbles across something incredible. This discovery makes the scientists put off all other plans for the mission. They focus on figuring out what the strange material found by the rover is. In the beginning, this lunar day is no different from any other. It begins on July 25th, 
when the rover starts making its way through an area pockmarked with tiny impact craters. U-22 is helped and monitored by the driver team from the Beijing Aerospace Control Center. On July 28th, the team is preparing to shut the rover down for a midday nap. The sun is high in the sky. It means there are high levels of radiation and scorching temperatures that can damage the machine. Before powering U-22 down, the scientists are looking through the pictures taken by the rover's main camera. That's when they spot it, a small crater filled with something that looks shockingly different from the surrounding landscape. Unable to identify the gel-like substance, the team orders the rover to check this bizarre finding. U-22 cautiously nears the crater to examine the weirdly colored stuff. The machine uses special equipment that detects the light reflected off the substance. It's supposed to help the researchers to understand the structure of the material. Unfortunately, the nature of the unusually colored finding has remained a mystery for over a year. No wonder that both the finding and the fact that initially there were no images of the enigmatic stuff sparked curiosity all over the world. The only available description of the substance was that it looked like a randomly colored, shiny gel, something that's rather odd for the dusty, arid surface of the moon. But finally, the mystery seems to have been solved. The researchers have analyzed the information received from the rover's equipment. As expected, the substance turned out to be made up of rock, greenish and glistening breccia, in a sample no larger than 20 by 6 inches. It's kind of like a geologic version of jello salad with fruit inside. If you melt it down, it'll look glassy. Breccia consists of sharp stones joined together by a chalky substance. The sample found on the far side of the moon is made up of a mix of different minerals. The main is a type of silicate that's one of the most common components in both the moon and Earth's crust. The piece also contains some glass, which means it could have formed during a volcanic eruption. But volcanic activity on the moon stopped more than three billion years ago. That's why the researchers are almost sure it's unlikely to be the source of the unusual finding. The material could have been created by a massive asteroid, comet, or meteorite that once hit the moon. During the collision, the pressure and temperature were so high that huge amounts of rock instantly melted. Some pieces cooled down rapidly enough to form glass. The rest gathered at the center of the impact crater and grew colder more slowly, forming a new rock. The substance was likely not formed in the von Karman crater, but in the nearby Finsen and Alder craters. The hollow where the rover made its finding was just seven feet across. Whatever left it had to be no wider than an inch. But then, it would be too small to create such a large piece of breccia. It's interesting that the material is similar to the samples collected by the astronauts from NASA's Apollo missions. One of those samples was made of dark, broken shards of minerals glued together. It also contains some black, shiny glass. It's not clear, though, whether it's the same as the stuff discovered by U-22. When the rover took photos and made its measurements, it was rather dark in the area. The quality of the images isn't that great. The experts also explain that the mission is examining a previously unexplored area of the moon. That's why they don't have any samples from that region to compare them with the greenish, shiny substance U-22 found. But if their guesses turn out to be true, then the far side of the moon might have more in common with the Earth-facing one than we used to think. But what's so special about this dark side of Earth's natural satellite, and why can't we see it? It's all because of the phenomenon known as tidal locking. Earth's only natural satellite rotates around its axis once in 27 days. It's the same amount of time it needs to go around our planet. That's why you always see the same face. To be precise, 59% of the moon's surface is visible to people. It means that you can catch glimpses of the satellite's far side at some times of the year. The moon's side we can't see is quite different from the one facing Earth. It doesn't have dark spots that are visible at night. Those are lunar basaltic plains called lunar maria. They were created by ancient volcanic eruptions. Those happened about three to four billion years ago. 
Instead of plains, the far surface of the moon has countless craters and tall mountains. One of the ideas about such a striking difference between the two sides is based on the collision theory. It claims that billions of years ago, Earth collided with another planet or some other massive space body. After that, the debris from this collision crashed with something that would later form our moon. That's why the satellite's landscapes differ so greatly. A more recent theory suggests that the Earth-facing part of the moon is warmer because of the heat radiated by our planet. During the period of volcanic eruptions, it was cooler on the farther side. That's why the minerals there became solid faster. They formed a protective layer shielding the moon's insides against the meteorites. But each impact left an impressive crater. At the same time, a much softer crust on the front-facing side of the moon spewed lava every time a meteorite hit it. After this lava cooled down, it covered the impact craters. Even though the far side is often called dark, both sides get almost the same amount of sunlight. The side we see looks a bit brighter because of the glow coming from Earth. There are two reasons why people are interested in exploring the far side of the moon. After leaving our planet, many radio waves get blocked by Earth's natural satellite. If astronomers could build their radio and optical telescopes on the dark side, they would get much more data. There would be no problems with any kind of interference. The telescopes would also be shielded from the glare of daylight coming from our planet. If telescopes were set up inside craters, they would also be protected from solar radiation. Astronomers would be able to get an incredibly clear view of the far regions of the universe. Plus, scientists believe there are great amounts of helium-3 on the opposite side of the moon. Earth is protected from solar winds that carry this gas by its magnetic field. But our natural satellite doesn't have such a shield. That's why experts believe the moon can be a perfect place for helium-3 mining. This rare element can be later used as the fuel for fusion reactors. Okay, show of hands. Who still believes that the sun goes around the Earth? <laughs> Nobody. Oh, but everybody used to. It sure looks like it does. The sun comes up in the east, the sun goes down in the west. The sun comes up in the east again, so the sun goes around the Earth. It seems intuitively irrefutable, and it is so. But it's not true. The sun doesn't go around the Earth. Everybody knows that, but only now. So why do people still believe the moon goes around the Earth? It's not true either. We have to go back over 500 years to begin to get an idea of how hard it is for science to change universally accepted facts. Nicholas Copernicus, around 1510, was the first to propose a heliocentric, sun-centered, solar system. But he didn't do it publicly. Copernicus privately circulated letters to other astronomers, explaining why the accepted fact of an Earth-centered solar system should be scrapped in favor of a more straightforward, more astronomically correct, sun-centered solar system. Copernicus's difficulty in promoting the sun-centered solar system depended on another bold conceptual innovation, that the Earth rotates. Copernicus's concept of a rotating Earth flew directly in the face of five literal statements in the Bible that the Earth was founded on a fixed foundation never to be moved. And the Catholic Church wasn't about to let that worldview be challenged or changed. Copernicus had too much to lose to go public with his revolutionary, pun intended, heliocentric theory as a churchman himself. 100 years later, Galileo Galilei wasn't so reticent. Galileo had observational proof to back him up because he had a telescope. In early 1610, Galileo first observed the moons of Jupiter and kept track of their orbits. Yes, the moons of Jupiter do orbit around Jupiter. They go round and round the giant planet in actual orbits, unlike, as we shall soon see, how our moon travels around the sun with the Earth. Galileo became famous, or infamous, as the case may be, because he discovered orbital motions that were not heliocentric, that did not fit the accepted worldview. It rattled civilization's Earth-centered cosmology. Galileo was indeed revolutionary. Later in 1610, Galileo observed through his telescope, which only had an aperture of one and a half inches. 
the planet Venus going through phases, just like the moon goes through stages. Galileo wrote that Venus imitates the moon in Latin in his notebook. There could be no other explanation for these observations. Venus was orbiting the sun. People were afraid to look through Galileo's telescope when he set it up in the great square of Pisa. They were too scared to have their worldview revolutionized. Strange as it may seem, we are experiencing something similar to that now, concerning the moon orbiting the sun and acting like a double planet with Earth. People, scientists included, stubbornly persist in viewing the moon as its clever official International Astronomical Union name. It's a moon of the Earth, orbiting around the Earth, showing its different phases throughout the lunar month, or moonth, as moon fans sometimes like to call the 29 and a half day cycle of lunar phases. Moon lovers' favorite day of the week, of course, is Moon Day. It comes right after Sun Day. But back to the science. It's how our school books portray the phases of the moon. It's what people believe now. Notice how the Earth is the moon's center, and how it goes around the Earth in a circular path. This is the geocentric view of the moon. It's what we see from Earth. The moon comes up, the moon goes down. The moon comes up again, the moon goes around the Earth. But that's not what's happening in space. It's way past time we copernicus size the moon. We need to start seeing the moon from a heliocentric point of view, as we do for everything else in the solar system. First of all, the geocentric view of the moon's phases shows the Earth stationary, sitting in the center of the moon's path for a whole moon, th- a month. But the Earth is not stationary at all. We're zooming around the sun at a very high speed anywhere between 66 and 68,000 miles an hour. Therefore, any picture of the moon going around a stationary Earth is profoundly misleading and really outright wrong. The heliocentric view of the Earth and moon moving together in space should look something like this. Notice that the moon is not going around the Earth. It's traveling along with the Earth, around the sun. The path of the moon around the sun is a sinusoidal path back and forth, back and forth, across the ever forward moving path of the Earth. Notice that the moon always goes forward too. It doesn't ever go backward to either the sun or the Earth. By always moving forward and sinusoidal, the path of the moon does not qualify as an orbit in the same sense that the other moons of the solar system orbit their planets in elliptical paths. Therefore, it is wrong to say the moon orbits the Earth. The moon orbits the sun along with the Earth, or the moon and the Earth both orbit the sun, are statements Copernicus and Galileo would approve of. But science today has difficulty accepting a heliocentric view of the moon. Maybe there would be too many books that need to be reprinted. Maybe too many astronomy professors would have to admit that they were wrong their whole careers. Accordingly, objections are put forward to block the revolutionary heliocentric view of the moon from being universally accepted. One such objection is that the moon never leaves the Earth's gravity well, and therefore should be rightly considered a moon of the Earth, an orbital to use the astronomical term for satellite. Undoubtedly, the moon never leaves the Earth's gravity well, or else we would lose the moon. However, representations of this well-known definite fact always show the moon moving around the Earth inside the gravity well. And this is not true. The moon never goes back toward the Earth as it would need to if it were in an elliptical orbit. So the gravity well objection can be dismissed because the astronomers who propose as orbital evidence that the moon always stays within the Earth's gravity well fail or neglect to include the facts of the moon's continuously forward sinusoidal motion. Escape velocity for the moon to leave Earth's gravity well is reported to be about 2,684 miles per hour. Relative to the Earth, the moon presently moves about 2,238 miles per hour. What kind of impact would it take to accelerate the moon that extra 450 miles per hour needed to knock it out of Earth's gravity well? If anyone wants to compute that, you're most welcome to put your answer in the comments section. Maybe it could happen and that would not be good. There's another objection to looking at the moon from a heliocentric point of view. And that involves the barycenter of the Earth-Moon system. The barycenter is the center of gravity between the Earth and the moon. 
Think of yourself on a seesaw in the park. The other end of the seesaw is a massive lineman from a professional football team. How far forward towards you would the lineman have to move so that you both are balanced evenly? He'd have to move towards you almost to the center of the seesaw. You are the moon and the lineman is the earth. Although earth is a feminine name. The balance point of the earth-moon system, the Berry Center, is over 1,000 miles inside the Earth. It is this balance point, astronomers dutifully point out, that is orbiting the Sun. It is a heliocentric point of view. Copernicus and Galileo would approve. However, these astronomers always seem to add the geocentric animation of the Moon orbiting around the Earth, with the Berry Center inside. In this way, they can keep the Moon orbiting around the Earth. But it's somewhat dishonest to combine two different perspectives in one animation. <laughs> you can't have your cake and eat it too. This leads us directly to the real sticking point that keeps us from believing that the moon is orbiting the sun, the double planet conundrum. The International Astronomy Union refuses to consider the moon and Earth a double planet. They refuse to do so almost exclusively because the very center of the Earth-Moon system is inside the Earth. It's tough to buck City Hall, as the saying goes. You'll recall that IAU, or UAI if you use the French designation, demoted Pluto to dwarf planet status. And they still haven't reversed that decision, despite seemingly ample evidence that Pluto is the ninth planet. Perhaps we should reflect on what it means to be an Earthling. To be an Earthling implies that we know ourselves to be space-born people orbiting a yellowish star near the outskirts of a spiral galaxy. We, meaning all the peoples of Earth, live in space and are absolute creatures from space. Above us is the Moon, Earth's companion. We're making a big mistake by referencing the Moon according to our geocentric parameters. Our conceptual expansion into space is inhibited by an incorrect, outdated, Earth-bound view of the Moon. The universe doesn't revolve around us, and neither does the Moon.